My name is uh, Kishore Mavubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this lecture by Professor Mohamed Yunus uh, at our school today. And I think as some of you may know, uh, whenever I make an introduction in the school, I make three points. So my first point, and I was discussing this with Professor Mohamed Yunus earlier, is about, of course, the country of Bangladesh, you know. And I remember that when, as you know, Pakistan split, you had West Pakistan, East Pakistan, and the 70s, you got all the bad news about Bangladesh. Everyone assumed that Bangladesh might become the failed state and Pakistan would succeed. And today, it's quite amazing that you get no news on Bangladesh most of the time. The no news actually is good news because Professor Mohammad Yunus was confirming to me that the economy has been growing at 5 to 7% uh, over the last few years. So it's a country that remarkably, despite all the odds, is doing very well, relatively speaking. And so, in a sense, we are very happy to welcome one of the glorious sons of Bangladesh here, uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus. The second point is about the topic, social business. And I'm really glad we have, in a sense, the pioneer of the concept here to share it with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Because, Professor Yunus, uh, our, the mission of our school also is to help improve lives, uh, uh, improve governance, and help people. In a sense, the, the, the strategic mission of the school is very much in alignment with the strategic mission of the goals that Professor Muhammad Yunus is working for. And I was telling him, actually, when I was speaking to him earlier, that when I studied economics in this campus from 1967 to 1971, no one mentioned social business at all. I mean, you had this old-fashioned theory that the only reason why you invest money is to make lots of money. And here we come along with a concept where you invest money to do good and not to make lots of money. And that's a whole new revolution uh, that has taken place. But uh, So this brings me to my third point, which is that when you have such a major intellectual revolution, uh, it doesn't happen naturally. Uh, intellectual revolutions take effort, and they take remarkable people uh, to produce such intellectual revolutions. And Professor Mohammad Yunus is clearly one of those remarkable people. Now, I could literally spend one hour uh, reading his CV and talking about him, but I think you already know uh, a lot more about him than even perhaps than I do. But I can tell you that I recently, Professor Mama Yunus and I were in Davos, you know. And so in Davos, you have, as you know, uh, very important people. And then you have very, very important people. And then very, very, very important people. <laughs> and for the people who are the very, very, very important people, you, you watch them walk down the corridors, you see the crowds part. And I could see the crowds parting when Professor Mohammed Yunus walking down the corridor. And I said, this is the real star uh, on the global stage. And of course, as you know, he, he has been recognized uh, not just in his own country, but globally. We all know that he's the Nobel Prize winner. But let me just mention two, three other awards, just as an illustration uh, of the kind of impact that Professor Mohammed Yunus has had. Uh, on the global stage. You know, he was chosen by the Wharton School of Business for a PBS documentary and listed as one of the 25 most influential business persons of the past 25 years. In 2006, Time Magazine listed him uh, at the 60 years of Asian heroes. Uh, in 2008, uh, in an open online poll, uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus was voted the second top most intellectual person in the world on the list of top 100 public intellectuals by Prospect Magazine and Foreign Policy Magazine. You can see that he's globally recognized, he's in demand all over the world. So we are truly grateful that Professor Mohammed Yunus has come for the second time to address the Lee Kuan Yew School. Thank you very much, Professor Mohammed Yunus.
Thank you, Kishore. After such a brilliant introduction, best thing you can do, shut up your mouth. <laughs> because if you speak, people will find out <laughs> you're not as good as he said. <laughs> so I'll dare, I'll say it anyway. And I'm delighted to be back here, Kishore. Thank you for inviting me. I was sitting there and looking at this, and I said, what, what happened to the first part of my name? Why you? Then it becomes Yunus. And I'm half done. <laughs> it looks so familiar. Uh, I will just update you, because uh, last time I talked about uh, microcredit and so on. Today I'll more focus on social business idea. But before I leave the microcredit part, since it's a, <clears throat> a school of public policy, uh, I'll f mention a few of the things that I have to struggle with in the public policy arena. Uh, one of the things that uh, when I was, st I started the microcredit part and I was trying to create it as a formal institution to create a bank. Uh, the government suggested that, uh, <clears throat> why don't you just take the usual banking law and create a bank? And I refused that stubbornly. I said, if I create the bank that I wanted to create under the existing banking law, sooner or later I'll become the same bank that everybody else has. And uh, that's not the kind of bank I wanted. I wanted a bank completely separate, different. So I was insisting on creating a separate law, which is not easy when somebody insists, one individual insists with the government, give me a separate law. Uh, government is, doesn't res respond very warmly to that. So it was a big struggle to make it happen. Finally, we created a law, uh, especially for creating Grameen Bank. That's a Grameen Bank law by itself. Uh, so this is one uh, I saw a very important piece because laws are like molds. Once you create that law, the society start taking shape according to the mold that you created. So one has to be very careful how we craft that mold because that's where the shape, no matter what the society is, would like to be, be by itself, but you put the law in such a way it start taking the shape of the law that you made. It has both positive points in it and strongly negative points of it. If you made the law wrong way, you create a wrong society. If you do it the right way, even at that point, it didn't look like what you needed, but in a futuristic way you did it, you create that future for yourself. And follow up of that, now after 35 years of what began in the tiny village in Bangladesh, became a global phenomenon called microcredit, microfinance, everywhere in the world. And people ask me, how come still microfinance doesn't kind of go out of the NGO activity. It's always done by the NGOs, except in a special case of Grameen Bank where you have a legal structure. Otherwise, it's mostly NGOs are doing that. And in some cases where banks have tried to do it, of course, from our view, they have done the wrong way of doing it. So that's a separate story. But mostly it's done by the NGOs. And the question is, why is it so? And how do we kind of break open from that? I said it's all because of institutionalization. The policymakers never paid attention to make institutions out of it. We create the methodology, but the institution part is missing. So NGOs who are used to doing lots of different things, they found it very attractive thing to do, to go to the poor people and start providing this service, which is a very important service, as, uh, which was missing. And then people responded to that. But the policymakers didn't respond to that. Policymakers stayed away, and even today, most of the countries, they stayed away. I am introduced in most, most of the time, telling that he is the banker to the poor. I said, okay, I like that. You, introduce me as the banker to the poor. And that is relevant. Relevant because I run a bank which specializes in servicing the poor people. That describes what I do. 
And this also describes what the conventional banks do. If I am the banker to the poor, who are the conventional banks banking to? Obviously, they are the banker to the rich. So if you have a two different class of institution, one banker for the rich and for bank, one other banker to the poor, we need two different legislations. What I started out, this kind of stubbornness that I showed in the beginning, not to get through that door and wanted a separate door, is still irrelevant. It's still relevant. People say, why don't they become a bank? I said, they, if they become a bank, they will become a bank for the rich. Because there's a law that has been created unknowingly. At that time, probably they didn't realize what they're doing. They created a law for creating bank for the rich. You cannot create bank for the poor by using that law because these are two separate worlds. What we need is to legislate that piece of legislation to create bankers, bank of the poor. So then this becomes an institution that becomes a part of the financial sector and so on and so forth. So this is a very important piece that is missing. Then once you have that piece installed, banks for the poor, second legislation or action becomes important. Create a separate regulatory authority. The moment you start taking public deposits. NGOs cannot take public deposits. That's why they are always ever dependent on finding money for their work. So wherever you go, you hear about how to find money for microcredit programs. You have many, many ways how to find money, going to the foundations, going to the bank, going to state, give us some money so that we can lend money to the poor people. That story will be over because now you can take the deposit from the, borrow, deposit from the public and lend money to the poor people. It solves all the problem. But as soon as you do that, immediately the regulatory authority comes in. You must create that regulatory authority. And there I always in insist that regulatory authority should not be the same regulatory authority which regulates the conventional banks for the same reason. They know how to regulate the con banks for the rich. And those ideas, those things which you are trying to protect the bank from and the country from, the economy from. It's not the same thing as regulating the bank for the poor people. So you need a different kind of regulators who understand the logic, who understand the system and methodology of bank for the poor people. So this is, I thought, I should uh, bring up front uh, on the microcredit side since I'm on the public policy arena. Uh, and uh, then while I'm doing microcredit and trying to persuade people uh, to, uh, to understand what I'm, I'm trying to do, uh, I did a lot of other things alongside. And I keep on creating companies after companies. Uh, it becomes a habit with me. I'm a kind of a serial company maker. So <laughs> uh, uh, every day or every week or something or every year I'm creating another company or some companies in the making. Uh, ideas are coming. Why don't we create company? Why do I do that? I did that. I didn't realize at that time. Now you're looking back probably you can put it in a general way. I did that. I wanted to solve some problem. Whenever I see a problem, I design a business to solve it. That was the only intention. I saw this is the most effective way of solving problems. And that's how one after another I did, create company after company. I wanted to promote the handloom products of Bangladesh. If you recall, Bangladesh is a country where muslin was made. Those who, the fabric which attracted the royalties of Europe in those days. And they wanted to find the route to India to find spices in the east and the muslin from the east. And that muslin is done in Bangladesh. That tradition continued in Bangladesh. But those handloom weavers who carry that tradition are very poor people. Their tradition, their skill never got any respect. Seeing that repeatedly what happens to those people, 
what goes on in the microcredit arena. Then I thought maybe I should try to promote their textile. So we created a company to promote their textile, the handloom products. And it became named as Grameen Shamugri or Grameen Clothes and things like that. And it started promoting that. So we created this company not for making money from anybody, just to promote that. And we started making fashion shows in Bangladesh, in Paris, and everywhere to promote fabrics. Like the one that I'm wearing today, this is the same fabric. We it, gave it a name called Grameen Czech. These are just ordinary sarong everybody wears. Suddenly we took the sarong piece, started wearing it. Women loved it, children loved it, young people loved it. So it has a new fashion. We have fashion shows for that. We tried our best, not that we found out the, uh, the ultimate solution, but our effort is to make it visible, make it important so that the people don't go without job with the skill in their hands, in their tradition, but they cannot express because there's no demand for it. We wanted to create that demand. Whenever you talk about poverty, one, answer to the question, why poverty? I always say, it's lack of skill. This is very standard kind of explanation, lack of skill. I said, Go, don't give me that. Because I know at least two million families in Bangladesh have excellent skill. Nobody can beat them at that in the whole world. But they are extremely poor. So what good is that skill? If that skill doesn't improve then their life and everything else. And these are the people who do the excellent work of handloom women. If you see any woman from Bangladesh or India wearing beautiful sari, most likely it is done by one of those weavers. When excellent, elegant saris. But those saris, which are very expensive saris they made, but never in their lifetime his wife or his daughter ever will be able to wear it. They cannot afford it. So that's the kind of tragedy that they make it, but they remain poor. Somewhere, somehow, economics doesn't work for them. So we create a lot of other companies. We created a company to bring solar energy in the country because Bangladesh is a country where 70% of the people don't have electricity. So we thought this is a good occasion for us to bring renewable energy. So we created a company Grameen Shakti or Grameen Energy, to bring solar power, solar home system in the villages. In the beginning, it's such a struggle to convince people in the villages to buy a solar home system. How, who needs it? It's too expensive. Our kerosene lamp is good. But gradually, we start selling one or two in a month, three in a month, four in a month. We didn't give up. We kept on thinking maybe we can sell 10 in a month. After 15 years, now we have nearly reached million solar home system in Bangladesh from this company. And today, every day, we sell more than 1,000 solar home system. And it became a familiar thing now. Who, who got it? Who doesn't have it? When do you have it next time? Because it makes so much sense. People finally accepted that this is the ultimate option for them to have electricity of their own rather than wait for the grid electricity, which in a lifetime probably will never come for them. So this is, we did it not for making money. We didn't see a market opportunity to make money. We saw an opportunity to solve people's problem. And we did it in a business way. It, it covers all its cost. It makes a surplus. Surplus is plowed back into the business. That's it. That's how that was done. Then I come to a general conclusion after I go through all this. Why poverty? Is poverty, is it caused by the poor people, something lacking in them? Lack of skill, lack of education, lack of initiative, lack of entrepreneurial ability. You can make a long list saying they are wrong. That's why they are poor. And the, working with the poor people every day you come to the conclusion, every one of that explanation is wrong. There is nothing wrong with the poor people. They're as enterprising as any enterprising person on this planet. They're as hardworking as any hardworking person on this planet. 
and you can go on saying that. They are as smart as any smart person on this planet. But they are poor. Who made them poor? If it is not their problem, if this is not their fault, is the fault of the system that we built. I go back to that system issue. System created this distorted outcome. And they are the victim of that system. And I give example. Who said banks should not lend money to the poor people? But they decided on their own. Financial system doesn't touch the life of the almost two-thirds of the world population. So what happens to them? You are having all the fun on the top. That fun should not be shared by the poor people. So they remain poor because they don't have the money in their hand for no fault of their, ass, their own. We were told it is their fault because they are not creditworthy. That's a funny explanation. You create a system which pushed them out and then say it is their fault. They are not credit worthy. We dared into it and make that what called microcredit and showed that they can lend, they can do as much banking as, as anybody else. And now I can say they do better banking than anybody else. We were running our Grameen branches in uh, New York City in 2008. And in the beginning of the 2008, there's a beautiful system working in the, in the Jackson Heights and Queens. And later half of 2008, financial crisis came. All the big banks are collapsing right there in front of us. And I said, somebody now come and ask me, some journalist, please come and ask me the question, who is credit worthy? I said, these people who has no collateral, nothing, their repayment is 99.9%. They have not faltered. Those are the guys who are the big guys with the big money, big collaterals, big lawyers, making absolutely sure no fault can happen, collapsing, melting away. Tell me who is credit worthy. In, in the entire financial crisis, when big banks were collapsing all over the world, you never heard any microfinance activity has to be stopped or slowed down because of payment, repayment problem, because of the financial crisis. Never. So systems are designed in the wrong way. And you punish the people for that. It's your inability to capture the essence of human life and punish the people for that person. So the policies are at fault. Institutions are at fault. And the design of the conceptual framework is fault. And I started saying, who told that business has to make money? Is the God said it? Bible said it? Quran said it? Who said it? That business means maximization of profit. Somebody in the brightest mind said that's what it should be. And we are following ever since. That is the only way we can design our social system. Run for money. I said, for the first thing, I must object to that because human beings are not just money-making robots the way the theory has designed us to be. We cannot think of anything else but money. Money has become the king. Money has become the intoxication. Money has become sometimes addiction. We don't know where you're making money, but we keep on making money. We became some kind of little insects who keep on doing things without knowing why, why they do the things the way they did it. And we are like that. If somebody from the other planets look at us, they wouldn't understand why they do it. Why do they go crazy about money? But that's what we are. That's what the system made it. I said, that's where the framework went wrong. Human beings are much bigger than just be, be treated as money-making robots. We are not robots, we are human beings. We are much bigger than robots. But the theoreticians played us into a tiny little money-making robots. And we are enjoying that role. And we create massive problems for everybody by squeezing ourselves into a tiny little role of money-making robots. 
I'm not against money making. All I'm saying, we are not created only for money making. We are created for many other things. We are multidimensional human beings, not single dimensional human beings. And I kept saying, we have, as a human being, we are selfish. This is our protective dimension. dimension. But as a human being, we are also selfless. How come we do not exercise our selflessness in the business world? The theoreticians tell us, if you want to be selfless, step outside of business. Be a philanthropist. Give away everything we want. But as soon as you enter the boundary line of business, you make money. I said, no. I want to be a full human being in the business world, too. You cannot treat me, a part of me, into the business world and tell me to get out to do the rest of it. I own, I'm not going to get out just because you're not smart enough to create a system so that I can express myself. So I should not suffer, nobody should suffer for the inadequacy of the people who have designed those system. And that's the point. The poverty is created by that. When the, you would talk about the crisis, everybody is writing editorials, post editorials, that the market has been transformed into gambling casino. It's no longer business anymore. People are chasing money mindlessly and in the meantime created all this mess that we have all around us. What about our selflessness inside the business? The one on the selfish business, we make everything for me. It's a self-centered business, nothing for others. I said I can e easily create another business where everything is for others, nothing for me, but it's a business. I play in the same rules, same game, same re regulatory framework, everything the same, except I decided not to take the money myself, dividend myself, I dedicate it to solve problems. Can business solve problems? Yes, it does. We use philanthropy to solve problems. And philanthropy, problems are solved, but money never comes back. I said, if I can transform this into a business, into social business, money will come back. So this same money can be used again and again. That's the whole beauty of the social business. So we created all this business that I was mentioning in that spirit. Each one created a problem, solved a problem, like problem of energy. We, create, we solved it by creating a business. Solving the problem of marketing, of the product that we felt very important for bringing income for people. We solved the problem by creating a business. So we can create... I have created many other companies, but one became immediately noticeable because I created it in conjunction with in joint venture with a big company called Danone. I told the Danone, I said, why don't we produce a yogurt in Bangladesh to solve the problem of malnutrition in Bangladesh? In Bangladesh, half the children of Bangladesh are malnourished, 46%. And if you are malnourished, if the child is malnourished, the future is lost because stunted physical growth, stunted mental growth, and so on and so forth. I said, we should do something about it. Let's try. Everybody else is trying, but let's try too. So we created that yogurt, put all the micronutrients into that yogurt, vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, as is needed, and made it very cheap. Because in social business, immediately, many of the cost items disappear because you are not up for making money. You are up for making sure everybody gets it. So your whole calculation process changes. Your mental exercise becomes completely different the moment you delink from the profit idea. And that's the beauty of the social business, delinking from that intoxication that you have behind your mind. Then you start looking at it more clearly because that's objective you have to fulfill. That's a mission of your business. We created that and started selling. Now, the first plant that we created is fully uh, operation, not only operation, fully utilized, it's full capacity utilization. We are now setting up the second plant in Bangladesh to expand it, and we continue to expand as we second plant capacities you like, we'll go for the third plant and so on. So that's a social business because Danone made it very clear, this we are going to do is only social business, that's what we do, they agreed with that. They will never take any dividend out of it. They will 
they are a, they will concentrate on solving the problem of malnutrition and they have dedicatedly has done this. So we have joint venture with Adidas. I challenged Adidas. He, I was invited to discuss social business with them. When the CEO of Adidas, Dr. Hainer, asked me what kind of social business can we produce, then uh, I said, why don't we have a mission statement? Nobody in the world should go barefoot. As a shoe company, we can produce shoes affordable even to the poorest person. He was shocked to hear that. It's so big an ambition. I said, Adidas is a big company. Why should you have a small ambition? He got the point. He worked very hard, discussed with his colleagues to make it happen. And finally, they agreed to produce that shoes. This is not charity shoe, I reminded them. We are not talking about make shoes, spend a lot of money, but sell it for one euro. I said, this should be shoes which cost of production should come near about one euro or less than one euro so that you can sell it at one euro. That's the price point you can charge. And finally, they made it. After two years of effort, many experimentation, they did it. So this is a social business. They know that this is a problem they want to solve because if you remain barefoot, you invite trouble for your body. You get all kinds of parasitic diseases into it. So that's a series of social business now is happening. Many companies are coming. We are continuing to create more companies. We are creating social business funds. Universities are creating social business chairs, social business programs, courses, institutes, and so on. So young people find it very interesting. For, for the first time, they see they themselves can address the problems without waiting for the governments, for the big guys to make decisions because they have all the creativity in the world to make a difference in the life of the people. So that's the story of social business, and I'll be very happy to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me begin by correcting a small mistake I made in the yeah. beginning, uh, which is that this lecture is organized not just by the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, but by Professor Wong Po Kam of NUS okay. Enterprise <laughs> and NUS Business School. Thank you very much, Po Kam Po. <laughs> thanks, to his thanks to his initiative, we are here uh, today. Now, I have the privilege, as you know, of asking the first question. And please, so those of you who have questions, please come to the mics. Uh, please stand, line up at the mics if you have a question. Um, so my first question is going to be a mischievous one. Go ahead. Uh, as you know... That's expected from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you know, when you think of uh, poverty, you think of hardship, you think of third world, and that's where the, most of the problems are. But we have a rather unique phenomenon now. And if you watch the troubles of Greece, I think the Greece, the Greek population is going to go through wrenching times <sighs> in the next five to yeah. 10 years. They will experience the sharpest drop in the standard of living that any developed society has seen in a long time. And no one is quite sure whether they'll actually turn the corner or not. You know. Uh, so the question is, has a time come for you now to go to a European Union member state and say, let me teach you how to handle poverty. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> poverty runs across the globe. I mean, it's not Greece. Greece is in trouble for the time being. Uh, but the, the poverty is a kind of lingering thing in every single country, whether uh, it's a USA or it's a UK or Europe. Uh, nobody is immune from that. Uh, being the richest country doesn't guarantee that you don't have poverty. Uh, I was just explaining about the microcredit in USA. Uh, now it's expanding from beyond New York. We are running programs in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, in Indianapolis, in San Francisco. This year we'll have another branch in Detroit. So, because people need it. Otherwise, they are the victims of the payday lenders, yeah. where the interest rate is 
hundred percent, five hundred percent, thousand percent interest yeah. is flourishing. So this is on the on the side of the my, uh, credit side or poverty side. Uh, Europe and the rich countries can hide their poverty. Hmm. We cannot hide poverty because we don't have the resources to hide poverty. Hmm. They hide poverty by giving them welfare benefits. Hmm. State comes and gives you the money. If you didn't give the money, they will be as poor as anybody else hmm. because you don't have any uh, access to the resources. If Bangladesh could afford to give uh, welfare to everybody, you won't see poverty in Bangladesh. Hmm. So hiding poverty is not the same thing as not having poverty. As long as a country has any kind of welfare system in terms of giving cash to the people mm. to survive, that's a sign of poverty. So I'm talking about those things. That department has to close down because nobody needs it anymore. That's the kind of society I'm talking about. Mm. Thank you. Now I'm going to start on the, my right here. And actually, I'm going to encourage Professor Prasanjit Dwara. You had a question. Why don't you go and stand over there? After the gentleman over here, please. Please go ahead. Good evening, uh, Professor Kishore Mabani and Professor Mohammad Yunus. I'm Vikraman from Inswal Institute. Okay. How, my question is, uh, I have two questions. How could the government build a sustainable economy working alongside social businesses, especially with the crisis? Okay. The second question is, with the problems of securitization secret and moral hazard, how could banks worldwide help Social businesses. <laughs> you bring too many points here. <laughs> One, two, two very big questions. Uh, big questions. One about the government. Yes, government, uh, definitely, government has lots of programs. Government has a lot of uh, social uh, pro programs to help the people who are deprived, all the people who are in distress. Every country has that. So here, here is a big package, social action, social uh, program package. Uh, they, they mostly come in terms of uh, handout kind of uh, mode because government loves to give something free to the people. And I'm saying not everything has to be done in that way. Some of these things can immediately be converted into nice little social business. Uh, we can try that. And if we can try that, this immediately relieves everybody. Because those people who are receiving in, they are doing their work. They are using their talent, their creativity to earn it, rather than become dependent on somebody else. Human beings should not be made dependent on anybody else. That is the first principle that we must accept. Nobody should be dependent. Our job is to make sure one can take care of himself, and he or she can take care of the rest of the world. That's what the human beings are all about, not become and the charity receiver from one source or the other source. So this is one on the government part. On the part of the banking system, I don't want to comment one specific thing. I am saying banking system has to be redesigned totally to make it an inclusive system where nobody should be falling through the crack. And you have to redesign that piece by piece. And it can be done because it has been demonstrated again and again. This is nothing impossible about it. It's very routine and very well managed system. It's not something uh, that you have to scratch your head. How do you do that? You don't have to scratch your head. It's been done very clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to follow an Asian tradition and yeah, ask my guru, Professor Dora, yeah. to ask the next question. Now, then I'll be coming around, so please right. be patient. Yeah. So, I'm sorry about this, but uh, yeah. I also have to leave soon. So thank you, uh, Kishore, for letting me cut in. Uh, I'm Prasenjit Dwara. I'm the Director of Research of Humanities and Social Sciences at NUS. And uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, it was a very inspiring speech. And uh, I also learned uh, uh, much more about your philosophy of uh, uh, social business uh, than I had uh, known before. Uh, as I had mentioned to you earlier, I was reading this essay just today, uh, article in the Herald Tribune. Uh, which had uh, a fair amount of criticism, and I, I want to get your view on this. The two types of criticism, actually one that they emphasize, but I don't know, and to get your view, especially from the Bangladesh perspective, because you began your uh, talk today by talking about certain important legislative pieces in place, and I wonder if that's the central issue here. Uh, the first thing they said was that 
it's not at all clear that it makes a difference in people's lives. But the second thing that has been of some interest to me, and I can't remember if they mentioned it, is that how do you, there is a tendency, and there has been over the last five years, of microfinance in particular, microcredit, um, sort of becoming runaway. And we know all the case in particular of Mexico and Vikram Akula and Andhra Pradesh and these kinds of things. Um, and that, there is, what I was very struck by was the philosophy that you say that. The idea is not, because being run away means where the robot takes over, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, right? So, I mean, how do you address these two, and is legislation a central part of it? Well, once you have the legislation, you can define what is microcredit. And that's a problem now. Everybody says we are microcredit. Even the loan sharks said we are microcredit. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stop them. Because they give tiny loans. <laughs> Are you saying that Bangladesh is the only country that has the proper legislation? And does it, in fact? And do you not have the same problems there? Uh, we don't have the same problem. But Bangladesh doesn't have the legislation yet. Only legislation is for Grameen Bank alone. It's a very specific legislation. But what I'm pleading with the government of Bangladesh to make a general legislation to create bank for the poor so that MFIs, or the microfinance institutions, as they are known as, can convert themselves as a tiny little banking institution, so that they can run as a bank, as an intermediary between the depositors and the law borrowers. But that piece has not been created. And unless that piece is created, there's always a dependency of the microcredit organizations on an external source of money. Andhra Pradesh doesn't have a legislation. India doesn't have a legislation. So that's why definition remain wide open. And as I said, traditional uh, loan sharks, they introduce themselves. They are microcredit. So the respectability of microcredit, the way people started admiring microcredit because for the first time they have done something which nobody else did. It created respectability. It created credibility. So that credibility and respectability, somebody is stealing for their making money. That's the unfortunate fact. That's all the crisis are all about. So we want to draw a line, what is microcredit and what is not. And I have definitions of what, what is that boundary line should be. Because microcredit was created to help people overcome their problems, particularly poor women. It was never seen as a mechanism to make money for somebody. And that's kind of mission drift which came. And, and runaway things. Not only mission drift, it went all the way up. And that's what created all the negative things that you kept hearing about it. And your first question was, sorry. That it is not making much, much of a difference. And I think in that same interview, I said it in this language, a little bit annoyed, but I said it. I said, if you are blind, if you don't see something, how can I make you see it? <laughs> you have to first have the eyes to see it whether it makes a difference or not. I see it because I, I'm with them all the time. And I see it very clearly. And I have no hesitation. If a woman who not dared to take a loan of $20, $30, was shaking, trembling, tears rolling down that she is holding such a huge amount of money. Today she's battling with the bank, give me 100,000 taka, give me 200,000 taka. It's a completely different woman. Her ch she came from a totally illiterate family. She herself is illiterate. Her son is now a, an engineer. Her daughter is a doctor. Uh, now, who, who was to say that nothing has changed now? I see a complete different change. If you look at Bangladesh, uh, Kishore knows it very well, Bangladesh. If you compare Bangladesh 25 years back and today, 25 years later, one dramatic thing you cannot miss tremendous change in the status of women across the country. Where did it all come from? Didn't microcredit play any role in it? Today we lend out, Grameen Bank alone lends out one and a half billion dollar every year. And all the NGOs together put another one and a half billion dollar. So you have three billion dollar in the hands of the poor women of Bangladesh. Whether they throw it out, whether they use it for consumption, whether they, they have $3 billion in their hand, that purchasing power. They dictate things because they have that purchasing power. Nobody sees that. 
So it said nothing happened. How, yeah. how can you explain that? Great. Now we can come back to the gentleman over here and then we go around, please. Yes. Hello. Hi, um, hi. professors. Okay, my name is Faris. I'm from a social enterprise called Social Creatives. What we do is legal vandalism, basically to make Singapore and society colourful, both visually and emotionally. My question is about selling to the government. So basically, Social Creatives started through the painting of trash bins along Orchard Road mm. because we felt Singapore was a very Lego, grey society. So we wanted to add colours into our social fabric. So we form an social enterprise, but during that period of time, the term social enterprise wasn't really that prominent. And what happened was we grew until to the extent that now we operate from a shopping mall and we have done over 150 public murals all over Singapore because we believe art to the heart. Absolutely. And in the word earth, in the middle of it is art, E-A-R-T-H, right. art engraved into our society. So we feel that um, the first way of communication and the first way of first form of arts is actually cave drawings. So that's public murals. So we are going backwards in terms of connecting us to the nation. So the, the problem that we are facing now is the government, um, this current government. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's okay. Um, before we don't we, understand anything about it. So, sure. don't. <laughs> yeah. so um, when we were formed, we said we do community art, art for the community, art to make society colourful, emotionally and visually. A picture speaks a thousand words, yeah. a motion is a thousand pictures, and emotion is a thousand motion. So we're here to basically spread emotions to people to cause a connection towards our home. You know, this, is, now, this, is, this is not the government stopping seconds, you, but uh, uh, there are I'll people behind you who... Who have been queuing for questions. Yeah. So be In fair to everybody. You can ask, maybe ask him a question. Yep. Yeah. So now the government seems to be promoting arts for the community, so on and so forth. And as a result, what we do seems to be diluted to the extent that we are thinking of even selling to the government. So what's the pros and cons of selling to the government? Because that's what Grammar Bank did. I have to figure it out. <laughs> what is the conflict with the government? Uh, they, are, they are doing your job on their own and you're, that is destroyed, that yep. you're, sure, okay. You, you have a big competitor, that's what. <laughs> 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 that's life in business. <laughs> life but in it, business. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I think his answer is you have a big competitor. No, I, I, I'm not, I'm just kidding, right? I'm, yeah. I, what, what government can, uh, government doesn't have to do everything. When citizens can do things, I think government should create a space for the citizens rather yeah. than government stepping in and doing that, everything I will do, yeah. citizens can stay out of it. Uh, so that's a general policy. On, on social business idea that uh, we have been promoting, we always insist, never take any special privilege from the government. This is number one issue that we always insist. Never take, just because you're social business, never come back to the government, give me this special privilege of these taxes, the regulations, and so on and so forth so that you remain independent on your own. You play with the same regulation with everybody else and continue with that. So with that skill, you fight back, do better than the government. Go ahead. Thank Congratulations. You. Uh, you know what, you know, there are lots of questions and I want to be fair to everybody. Uh, you know, the, when I was in Davos, the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School said the, uh, an ideal question is one where you, number one, state your name, Number two, make a very brief statement. And number three, end with a question mark. <laughs> so if you don't mind. Sorry. <laughs> can you just, if, to be fair to everybody, we have 20 minutes. Can each of you, I'll, I'll take, I don't know, I'll take uh, maybe these two here. And then, I know you've been waiting over there a long time, the gentleman in green, I'm going to go over there. And then uh, we keep it moving in the rapid clip, if you don't mind. So can the two of you quickly post two, two short, sharp questions after identifying yourself? It's a pleasure to see you again, Dr. Dunos. I met you in Texas a few years ago. I'm James Norris. I'm a kind of a serial company maker too. I'm on my sixth. And my question is pertinent to the uh, text right behind you, creating a social, a supportive environment for social business. I'm very curious where you think the world's first social Silicon Valley will arise, where government and social entrepreneurs, social business entrepreneurs, impact investors, and venture philanthropists come together to build some kind of haven that supports this growth. What city or what place will that, will that come, around, come about from? Good question. Next gentleman right behind you. Yeah. Hello, Professor. My name is Vincent Hui. 
know each other, but um, for Professor Kishore uh, Mahubani, sorry for the pronunciation, I have a, a question about uh, Singapore. I want to create a social business, but I, I'm not sure where I can check the box of creating a business that don't want to make profit. Um, does that exist here in Singapore? Is there an option while you create a business <coughs> but not to make profit? Um, and would that, wouldn't that be a first step uh, to um, uh, improve the awareness about social business as something that can be done, creating a business while not pursuing profit? Mm. Okay, so you want to answer the first I'll, question, and, I'll and then I will, I will avoid answering the second question. No, I'll, I'll, answer, <laughs> I'll answer both. I'll answer. Okay, uh, <laughs> Silicon Valley, it could be anywhere. And you said, which city? I said, why should, why should it be in city? It could be in the village too. It's a Silicon Valley. We don't need a city. You could be in a beautiful uh, environment and the fresh air and you'll be working. And it could be anywhere. It all depends on number of people who gather together, create it on their own, and it's a business. You want to change the world with the technology because technology will change the world dramatically. This world today, in 20 years' time, will be completely different because of the technology. Technology has started sipping in, just creeping in. We have not really seen the impact in our life yet. It's just a started feeling. Once you start using this, making impact, this will be a completely different situation. But before that situation arises, we have to figure out what kind of society we would like to be. We have to dream about that society. Unless we dream and design, we'll get lost. Speed of this technology will be so fast, it will be in all directions. You will be directionless. We will be all directionless people shooting into different directions. That's why it's very important vision together. What, as a human being, would like to be on this planet? What is it that we are aiming for? What is the purpose of our living here? And that's the visioning purpose is very important. And the next question about not making profit, you don't need a separate law. That's what I was just mentioning. That you work with the existing law. You, it is your decision. It's a government decision. You decided not to take your profit. That's your decision. What government has to do with it? The company makes profit. You said, I don't want it. I want to keep it with the company. Government doesn't have to interfere with that. And no law says government say, you must make profit. I don't think government has gone that <laughs> wild yet. <laughs> so government is left, has left it to you to decide what you want to do with your profit, whether you want to take it or to leave it to the government. But you can also talk to Professor Wong Po Kam later. He can give you some sense of what's doing social enterprise. So gen gentlemen in green, you've been very patient. So I'll come to you before okay. I go back there. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pras. I'm the student of NUS. I have two questions for Professor Muhammad. Short, Yunus. please. Sir. Okay. First, do you think the social business will replace the conventional way of doing business? Because what I see, the social business is a good platform for the poor to leverage themselves so they can fight the current capitalistic environment in the world. So in the end, after they see they, they are credit worthy by the conventional bank, after they are being leveraged by their social business, do you think there will be a good supply of the conventional capitalisms? And the second question is, is the poverty reduction is the key point of human capital development? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, theoretically, yes. Uh, the whole world can be run by social business. There's no problem with that. Uh, everything can happen. The growth can take place. Accumulation can take place. Everything can take place. Only personally, I'm not taking money out of it. So there's no problem with that. That's a theoretical issue. But practically, what will happen? Practically, it will coexist. And I give example of one city in Germany which has decided to apply that. This is the city of Wiesbaden, which is next to Frankfurt. It's one of the richest cities in Germany. The mayor of the city has announced that Wiesbaden will be, from now on, a social business city. And he has defined what he means by social business city. He said, my city has more than 3,000 businesses working in our city. And I would help each, each company, each business, to create a parallel social business to address the problem that we have in our city. So each one will contribute in solving the problem in a business way. Uh, each business has a capacity to do such thing. It can be a very small one, but we would like to have all these 3,000 businesses to have 3,000 social businesses in parallel. Because city has a big budget 
to hand out money to the unemployed, hand out money to the poor, hand out money to the old, and all kinds of that. So he says, why should city remain in a handout city? Why don't we create social business so that everybody will be a dignified person and each business will play a role in it? That's the idea. So we are not taking away all the businesses. Businesses remain conventional business. But along the side, they can create social business. That's all I did. And the next one, poverty reduction. Of course, it's a very important thing. Poverty is not, un it's not it cannot be an acceptable thing in any decent human civilization. So we have to create a new civilization completely. And then this is the time we're in right now. One civilization is ending now, and we are ready to move into a new civilization. And that civilization, uh, the talk that I'm mentioning, that we are dreaming part, in that civilization that we dream, there will be not a poor person. There will be not an unemployed person, ever. There will be not a single person who will be dependent on government subsidy and welfare. And that will be a world. The planet will become safer every day rather than the other way. So these are our dreams. And we can sit down and start working on it, design it. Because we have to create that world by design, not as by default, that nothing happens so we carried on what my father did, what my parents did, what they're getting. This is what we are doing today. We have not done anything different. So by design, we have to create that. That's a challenge. Okay. Two quick questions on the corner of the back there, please. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, my name is Sean. Um, I help to run Singapore's only superhero agency that I know of. Um, one only Singapore's question. what agency? Superhero agency. You want to know more, Souvenir? you can talk to me. Um, <laughs> if you don't know, you have to talk to him. Yeah, yeah talk to me. <laughs> That's so, a good one. <laughs> so, um, quick question. I, too many really, really great concepts, like microfinance, for instance, or the thing that I do a lot of, which is called design thinking, there's a phase where there's a lot of hype around it, you know? And everyone gets sucked in and saying that microfinance is so wonderful. I come from the church of, you know, uh, microfinance, and we have our Pope sitting in front of us. <laughs> but there is a challenge here. I bless here. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but there, there, there is a real challenge here um, when, when hype becomes dogma. And dogma becomes, and I was not kidding, I was not, that was not a compliment just now when I said it's a religion, because sometimes it becomes dogma and people follow it for the sake of following it. And with dogma comes, can come a corruption of a spirit. So how can microfinance maintain its core integrity as it spreads all across the world? Okay, is that your question? Next question behind you, then we can, can you uh, answer both? Justin Ho from uh, Utiba. Um, I have a question regarding disruptive technology approach to making change. Um, as you're aware that you have uh, uh, mobile financial access systems like Gcash in the Philippines, M-Pesa in, in Kenya, who have made a difference, um, and they've done it through removing cost out of the, the, the banking infrastructure. It's made the banks take up and uh, sit up and, and, and take a look. Um, whereas in some countries like uh, India, getting the RBI to change its mind and letting somebody else take the lead um, has taken forever and no real progress. So on one hand, you have a disruptive technology which is making a difference. On the other hand, you have trying to get the government to make a change. Uh, in case A, it's for profit, but at least something is changing. What do you believe is the best way to do it? Yeah. Okay, two questions. One on yeah. dogma, the other one on disruptive Indeed. technology. Yeah. The dogma is bad because you are not going into the content of it. You are just repeating it because somebody says it's good and you are not opening that up. And that's an important thing, what you said, is the integrity of the system. So everybody has to understand what this is all about. Nothing which is followed as a dogma does anything any good to anybody. So nobody will support that. We have to find out how to make sure that we do it because we like it, because we think it's important. That's how it should be done. Uh, and this, of course, disruptive technology, that's what I was saying. In 20 years' time, it will be so different. We'll do things in a very different way than we do it today. Uh, all our institutions, which are built over many, many years, suddenly will become irrelevant. Suddenly, technology will make them irrelevant. And if you want to, to keep them alive, you have to kind of put a boundary that here we have to, don't want to. This is our heritage. We want to keep it as a kind of memory. Because in real life, you don't need it anymore. So in that tremendous upsurge of this new inventions, new creative idea will be flourishing. And today's generation is much more creative power 
than our generation when we were at the age of those young people because we didn't have that opportunity to exercise those uh, technology in our own hand. But you, the young generation who are coming up, they are born with that technology and they, they know the ins and outs and the speed of that technology absorbs in their body, in their mind. So they will be moving very fast. So this is this disruptive technology will happen. But I objection only thing, you say government do make the changes. I said no, citizens will make the changes. Is there a because citizens as an individual are much more much powerful than an institution as a government as an institution. By by very design of the government, it's a slow moving machine. It cannot move fast. But individuals can do just like that immediately. But, I think his question was, you know, is you know the Reserve Bank of India will not allow the kind of Kenyan mobile banking. Yeah, and that's what's the, slow, and so, slow so, moving. So, that's what I'm saying. So what do you do in that situation where the government uh, blocks on, change? Yeah, you keep on shouting at the government because <laughs> that's a political process. <laughs> that's you not keep... allowed in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> He's not talking about Singapore. He's talking about well, India. India. Okay. In India, India is very good at shouting. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. Thank you. Okay, the two questions in front here. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Hi, good evening, professors. Uh, my name is Amelia. I work at World Vision. So our concern, my, my greatest concern is the poorest of the poor. So a lot of social businesses, they target people who are living from like two to eight US dollars a day. But I'm asking about people who live under two dollars US a day. How are we able to reach them? And I was very privileged to go with Jack Sim to visit Bragg last year. And do you see actually the amalgamation of um, both business and NGOs together, maybe in the forms of international NGOs and MNCs working together to create um, solutions to reach to these people who live under two US two dollars a day, for example, in northern Sudan and places like that. Sure. Okay, be, the gentleman behind you, and then then I'll come to the last two questions after that. Okay. Good evening, professors. My name is Marcus. Given the interest in ministerial pay in Singapore, my Sorry? question is: What guidelines do you have for paying employees in social business? Because after all, the lower your operating costs the more profits can plow back into the social costs. Okay, so the first question, the poorest of the poor, the yeah. second question about salaries of social business. Yeah. Uh, poorest of the poor can be reached by combination of what you said. Of course, you can do that. And all forms can be tried out, uh, combination of NGO companies and so on. <coughs> But the companies can reach out too, themselves. It doesn't have to be uh, NGO. Uh, like Grameen Bank reaches out to uh, poorest of the world. Uh, Grameen Bank lends money to beggars. So we had no problem with beggars. They're as good as a, uh, a credit taker as anybody else. So once you design the system in the right way, it will be done. It, will be, it can be done as a business, you can do, uh, of course, as an NGO, if, by NGO, if you mean as someone who deals with charity, you can do that. But you can also do it as a business too. It's a question of how you design that. And the next one is about the employees of social business. In social business, employees are paid at the market rate. These are not volunteers. It, uh, we are having some confusion about it. Social business is a business. Only thing missing in the social business than the regular business is, the, is taking profit out of it by the owners. Otherwise, everybody gets paid by decent salary. And we are also insisting, since it's a social business, people who are at the lower rank of salary wage receiver, their wage should be more decent than the conventional companies. Because after all, if you are a social business, you cannot squeeze the wage just like the profit-making wages. So you should be giving them decent wages, decent life for the people who work for you. So that is not compromised. There are seven principles of social businesses. One of them is to ensure that your workers are happier than workers anywhere else. So that's, so social business doesn't mean we have to do it as a, as a kind of a voluntary work or a, I'm, I'm doing social business, so I have to sacrifice my career. No, social business is your career. You get paid at the market salary. If you are, whatever market salary you can demand in the market, you charge yourself to your own social business. And if you cannot pay it, then it's not a business. Close it down. Hmm. Okay, the last two questions, gentlemen over here and gentlemen over there. And I think we should finish on time. There'll be a reception outside where I hope you can stay for a few minutes and meet them, sure. everybody. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. please. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, yeah. Professor Mabubani. Uh, Professor Yunus, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say, uh, 
Uh, you can, have you, inspired... can you identify yourself to him, please? Sure. My name is Sanjay Sivanandan. Uh, I run a global uh, software company based out of Germany. Uh, we are very much in the IT field, in the field of construction, to reduce cost uh, and hopefully uh, bring profits back to the societies. Um, actually, I, the, I want to just make one statement that uh, you have inspired many people. For me, the one, one moment it happened was when I saw you talk somewhere and you made one statement that has stuck in my head and it was something like this, and please forgive me if I get it wrong. It was, uh, poverty is man-made, so it, poverty can be man-destroyed. Help make poverty, help me make poverty part of our history and not our future. Sure. And this has stuck with me in the last three or four years because I travel quite a lot as you do and I see the extremes. Uh, of the high growth, the extreme poverty, and, and the extreme wealth. Um, and I think it is, I have a number of ideas, but I don't want to share it here. I would if I have the yeah, opportunity, I would really delighted. love your input because I have a few ideas taking your same core thing in which you apply to microfinance and everything else. But being an entrepreneur my, myself, I think the core question for me is, I always ask myself this in business every day, you know, you, know, you learn lots of things doing it because it's one thing having an idea to actually make that idea happen especially if it's a revolutionary idea, it's extremely difficult because they, there's a lot of resistance from every corner. So in your case, sir, um, you know, from your experience, if you knew now, if you knew then, sorry, what you know now in doing the things you have done, what would you have done differently to accelerate okay. the process? Excellent question. The last question. It better be brilliant, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Ivan. Um, I, I've started a social business. I'm still trying to get it started. It's been one and a half years. My question is to eradicate poverty, um, we need to first define poverty. Uh, and since two-thirds of the world are living in poverty, so as to say, I guess there will be many different kinds of people who are living in poverty. What are the different types, in your opinion? Some, maybe three generations in poverty. Some maybe slipping into poverty. Um, how do you see this? How do you define poverty? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. What, what would you have done differently and how yeah. do you define poverty? Very easy question. Very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what, probably I would have done the same thing, basically. I'm, I'm very lucky the way it all went. Uh, uh, there are struggles, there are difficulties. It's part of the life. When you bring something new, something different, of course, there will be reactions, and you deal with those reactions. Only one thing I should say I sh probably could have done without it, but I did it. Uh, I started in 76 with our own money, and we never looked for money outside. It's all from the system that we work with. In 1983, when we became a bank, we accepted foreign money as a loan and as a donation for the first time from IFAG. International Fund for Agriculture De Development. We are very resistant. We are trying to make sure they don't give us. But they were so insistent to give us this money. And they pursued and lobbied with the government to give this money to us. The pressure came to me to take this money because government are good. This is foreign exchange. We yeah. must take it because government will be profit, uh, uh, will be help, happy to get this foreign exchange. So finally we took it. And then other donors came and gave us money. And we started taking money from the donors. In 1995, we decided that we'll not take any money from anybody because we have enough money for ourselves. And donors were very unhappy with us because they cannot give us the money. But we never went back to that. So I should have resisted very stubbornly with the government that we'll not take any money because we could make without those money because we are a bank, we can take money as a, as a deposit, we can lend money. Right from the beginning, we could have set the tone of the bank without this getting disrupted for this period, taking money from outside. That's only change. And what I said about poverty, I just add one more thing. Uh, I was almost beginning to say that. I said poverty is externally imposed thing on poor people. Since it's external, it can be peeled off. This is not inside the human being. It is imposed by the system. So if you correct the system, you change the system, poverty will disappear. So that's the point I was making. And also about defining poverty, you define yourself. Whatever you think this is the poor, poor people, and work for it. You don't have to become an academic, write books, what is poverty, how many types of poverty. <laughs> you pick up the one you like and work for it. Don't get your life complicated. <laughs>
Now, now, now you put me in a very uncomfortable position. I have to defend my fellow academics who write lots of books. No, this is their job. To I know, I know, I know. But anyway, as you can tell, uh, we've been very privileged to be here. I should tell you a secret, by the way. You, know, you, may, you may think that getting a room like this, full house, standing room is normal. I can tell you this is very abnormal. Oh, and I'm really delighted to get such a huge sellout crowd for an idea in Singapore that's not going to make any money, <laughs> which is very rare. <laughs> and <laughs> it's actually a real tribute to our school and, and to Singapore that we can produce a sellout crowd Absolutely. for social business. So Fantastic. thanks to you. Thank you. Your dream is now shared in Singapore. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good point. <laughs>